ready to take notes because our presenter will be taking us on a journey. But just before we begin tonight, I invite Pastor Dale Hewitt to be coming to us and he will be doing the opening prayer. Thank you, Minister Anderson. Psalm 119 verse 90 says, your faithfulness continues through all generations. You established the earth. It endures. God's word along with his faithfulness will never be shaken. It is fixed and firm and completely trustworthy. Father, we give you thanks tonight that we are able to meet in this fashion. We thank you, Lord God, that your presence is with us. We thank you, Jesus, that you continue to strengthen us as a school. You continue to touch us, God, and equip us for the journey. As we grow throughout these years, Lord God, may you continue to rain down your glory and your power upon us, God, that we will continue to go through and break through borders, break through boundaries, break through walls with innovation, God as we delve into the things that concern you, God, and theological education, may you continue to fortify our roots. God, the panelists who are here, those who will be partaking in this program, we pray your blessing. We speak to technology to operate how it should on our behalf tonight. Father, we give you thanks for the students who are on. We give you thanks for all participants, God, but you know them by name and by number. And as we rely on you to take us through the rest of this program, may you continue to grant us knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and intuition. We give you praise and glory as we put you first in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Dale, for opening up with prayer tonight. As we continue, we are going to be inviting to come at this time and make us feel even more welcome, Dr. Isin Campbell, Director of the CEDU Unit, the Christian Education Development Unit, and also the President of NCBIC. Dr. Campbell, over to you. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Okay. Um, and welcome, everyone, to our webinar this evening. I want to acknowledge our moderator, Minister Sharika Anderson, lecturer at NCBIC, our national bishop, Dr. Winston Lee, our esteemed keynote speaker, Bishop Valentine Rodney, members of the Education Committee, members um, of NCBIC board, students of NCBIC, brethren and friends, good evening and welcome this evening. Our education week got off, to, got off the ground on a good start on Sunday, and I have no doubt that this evening's activity is going to be just as enriching and enlightening. The department has put on numerous lectures since 2018, and we can almost say this activity is becoming one of the flagship of our department. Our theme growing stronger through theological education echoes the call for our people to know to grow, therefore moving away from nescience and mindless endeavors. It is interesting that this evening that we have left, sorry, it is interesting that this evening our focus is on Pentecostalism and COGOP contribution in Jamaica. Let the record show that this evening we have left footprints on the Pentecostal platform. As minuscule as one might view the book done by my colleagues and I, Global Pentecostalism, and this is the book, Global Pentecostalism, Jamaica's Response. It is among other 
Global Pentecostalism Scholarship work on Amazon when you search for global Pentecostalism. Therefore, let it not be said in any quarters that Pentecostals are asinine who absolutalize experience at the expense of reflection. According to Scott, the Jamaican Church of God of Prophecy has much to be proud of, not only through additional or, or individual actualization in academia, but also institutionally, as we have forged a path with UCJ toward course accreditation, which speaks volume to the type of journey we have created for ourselves. So I called on our students that are on and welcome to our students. Glad that you're on to our pastors, to our ministers, to our lay leaders, ministry leaders, brothers and sisters. All of you are on this evening and we are proud to have you on. And I say to you, engage in theological knowledge. This is your lecture this evening. Feel free to end at the end to participate and um, get into the question and answer section and ask your questions and make comments. And it's not even too late to either invite a friend or an acquaintance to join us this evening. May God bless you and may God bless Jamaica. Shalom. Thank you so much, Dr. Campbell, for that warm welcome and just briefly reminding us that we too are a part of a rich history of Pentecostalism. We, we rejoice tonight because we are a part of an organization that is making impact. Coming to us now to greet us is none other than our national bishop, Bishop Dr. Winston Lee. Thank you very much, Minister Sharika Anderson, and uh, I recognize you as our moderator for this evening's webin webinar. Also I'd like to recognize our Christian Education Director, uh, Minister Dr. Ison Campbell, our special guest speaker, Bishop Valentine Rodney, members of the Christian Education Committee, members of the board of NCBIC and webinar attendees. I greet you well in the name of the Lord. Well, I am extremely proud this evening to be a member of the Church of God of Prophecy, and more so in this time when we have embarked on a Christian education for over 60 years as a church, how we have evolved to this time where we are now celebrating Christian Education Week. And the theme for this week lines up with our second core value, of leadership development. And I want to express my gratitude to Minister Dr. Campbell and her team for ensuring that we continue to fulfill this core value in Jamaica. And as we are in our centennial year, how, what a time for us to examine Jamaica's contribution on the landscape of Pentecostalism in Jamaica uh, or the church's um, contribution. I am positive that many of us didn't dream that we would become the second largest Pentecostal uh, church or organization in Jamaica. And I'm saying that we are growing stronger and we will grow stronger. This evening's lecture is to open the eyes of all of us who are on this platform to understand that we are on a journey. And as we evolve on this journey, more will be seen and heard of this organization. So I am happy to be a part of this webinar this evening, and I greet everyone this evening, and I say God bless you, and God bless Jamaica land we love. Thank you so much, Bishop, for greeting us tonight. We are grateful. Just before we continue, I just want us to know that if we already have questions, because we're already getting information, please feel free to go ahead and type your question in the Q&A feature. If you look to the bottom of your screen, you'll see something marked Q&A. You can go ahead 
and you can start putting your questions in. You don't have to wait until the end. If you have questions from now, please go ahead and, and type them in the Q&A section. Now, Bishop alluded to the fact that this year we are celebrating, you know, 100 years in Jamaica. And I agree. What better time it is for us to just pause and reflect, you know, to look at our, our contribution in terms of Pentecostalism in Jamaica. In a time when many are questioning the relevance of the church, it is quite fitting for us to revisit our history, to explore our history, to see where we're coming from and to make note of our contribution. So coming to us now is Sister Yannick Davis, one of the students of NCBI. Good evening, everyone. And to our moderator, Minister Anderson, good evening to you as well. As we embark on this evening's theme, Growing Stronger Through Theological Education, I am just here to encourage us in a song that we can only be stronger when God is in it. May you be blessed. We will go in your strength. In your strength we will go. We will flourish until the moon, the moon, the moon is no more. You are my maker. Mm -hmm. You knit me in my mother's womb. Oh, yes, you are my helper. Oh, Lord, when I know you won't chase me away. You are my keeper. Oh, through it all, I know that I will prevail. You are my armor, Lord, so my protection is guaranteed. You are everything we need, everything we need. You alone will do. So we will go in your strength. Oh, in your strength we will go. We will flourish until the moon, the moon, the moon is no more. We will go in your strength. In your strength we will go. We will flourish until the moon, the moon, the moon is no more. You are my healer, Lord, so healing will spring forth speedily. Yeah, you are my father. No good thing will you withhold from me. You're my deliverer. Every yoke of bondage is destroyed, so we will go in your strength. In your strength we will go. We will flourish until the moon, the moon, the moon is no more. We will go in your strength. In your strength we will go, we will flourish until the moon, the moon, the moon is no more. Hallelujah, we will go, hallelujah, we will go, yes, hallelujah, we will go. Hallelujah, we will go, say, we will go in your strength. Lord, in your strength, we will go. We will flourish until the moon, the moon, the moon is no more. Hallelujah, we will go, yeah. Hallelujah, we will go. Hallelujah, we 
will go. Hallelujah, we will go. Say, we will go in his strength. Yeah, in his strength, we will go. We will flourish until the moon, the moon, the moon is no more. Hallelujah, we will go. Hallelujah, we will go. Hallelujah, we will go. Hallelujah, we will go. We will go in His strength. In God's strength, we will go. We will flourish until the moon, the moon, the moon is no more. We will flourish, flourish, flourish until the moon is no more. God bless you all. Wow. Thank you so much, Sister Davis for such wonderful, wonderful singing. And we join with you in declaring that we will go in God's strength. It is his strength that has brought us through these 100 years and we will continue to go forward in his strength. Our presenter is coming tonight, but just before he comes, I want to acknowledge those who have joined us via YouTube. And I also want to encourage us, we still have time to share the link, to invite somebody so they too can come on and be reminded about the contribution of the Church of God of Prophecy. Also, please be reminded that you don't have to wait until the end to ask your question. You can start putting them in the, in the Q&A section from now so that your questions can be adequately dealt with all right so please go ahead and invite someone go ahead and share the link so that we all can be empowered and informed tonight as well as be reminded of our history all right at this time minister jennifer richards our administrative secretary will be coming to introduce our guest speaker after which you will be hearing directly from Bishop Valentine Rodney. Over to you, Minister Richards. Are you hearing me? Thank you so much, Minister Anderson. Yes, we're hearing Loud you clearly. And clear. Loud Thank and so clear. Much. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. We have come to the most important part of this evening's webinar, our special lecture on Pentecostalism, Pentecostalism in Jamaica, the contribution of the Church of God of Prophecy. This evening, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter, a well-known minister in the Church of God of Prophecy in Jamaica and internationally, who has been recently ordained bishop. And so at this time, I will share his profile. Profile for Bishop Valentine Rodney. Bishop Valentine Rodney is married to Yvette for over 26 years, and the union has produced two daughters. He has served the body of Christ in capacities to include the pastorate, evangelism, teaching, and the training in a wide cross-section of disciplines. He is the co-founder and deputy director of Impact Online Bible Institute, Builderman Foundation, and the Director of Word Impact Ministries International. He is host and presenter of the television program, 
Word Impact, aired on Mercy and Truth Ministries TV and an instructor for Walk Through the Bible Ministries International. He has ministered in Europe, Africa, Canada, USA, and the Caribbean in crusades, conventions, seminars, workshops. His ministry has been described as transformational, and through the help of God, he has had significant impact. He has served in the Church of God of Prophecy National, nationally in areas of National Christian Director, National Evangelism Director, National Missions Coordinator, National CPMA Director, National Prayer Coordinator, and National Radio and Television Director. He currently serves on the National Ministerial Review Board. He has authored four books, with two being translated into Spanish and has co-authored seven others. These include the Amazon bestsellers, Shameless Persistence, The Audacity of Purposeful Praying, The Power of the Secret Place, the place of relationship, resolution, and revelation. A way of escape. How to handle the tests and temptations of life. Prescription for healthy relationships. A practical guide for overcoming offenses. And build a man. A mentorship guide for the developing men. He remains passionate about believer empowerment and soul winning and has been intricately involved in ministerial training and development programs in several countries. He is a graduate of the University of the West Indies with a BSc in marine biology and a graduate degree in missions from the Caribbean Graduate School of Theology. His motto is, go where there is no path and leave a trail. I now invite you to sit back, be engaged, be edified, and be empowered as I invite this evening's presenter, Bishop Valentine Rodney, to take the platform. Over to you, Sir Rodney. Thank you, Minister Richards. A pleasure of mine to be here um, this, this, this um, in, in, tonight, um, especially to share on such um, a very important subject. I want to extend greetings to our moderator, Minister Shanika, Sharika Anderson, to our uh, director of NCBIC, um, Dr. Hyson Campbell, to our national bishop, Bishop Dr. Winston Leaf, and um, to all those who are online, and of course, those who form a part of the panel. I thought long and hard as it relates to this particular subject. And one of the things that will definitely come through or bleed through is the fact of what really should be the contribution of the Church of God of Prophecy as a Pentecostal organization. I, I will make some attempts to perhaps highlight some things that we have done, but I think more so what I'd want to do is to engage us in a thought journey where we begin to take another look at Pentecostalism, both historically and more so the emerging Pentecostalism that is going to be more applicable especially in light of what's going on. As I thought about it, one of the thoughts that came to my mind is that if we're going to have a discussion of Pentecostalism, that cannot be divorced from the relevance of Protestantism. Because when you look at it carefully, Pentecostalism most time is looked upon as an experience Whereas Protestantism is looked upon as a movement. But what we're going to discover is that Pentecostalism is a part of the Protestant movement. Now, the largest Protestant denomination 
in Jamaica is currently Pentecostal. And of course, this is followed by Anglican, Lutheran, Baptist. But the percentages are, are close, varying from 10.8 in terms of Pentecostal and 9% in terms of Baptist. Now, Pentecostals believe that all Christians should seek a post-conversion experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is normally characterized by speaking in tongues as the initial physical evidence thereof. The research has also shown that when you look at Protestant denomination, it makes up about 65% of the population. Now, in terms of Protestantism, this began in Northern Europe in and around this, the 16th century. And it came about as a reaction to medieval Roman Catholicism in terms of both its doctrines and practices. But what is discovered is wherever Protestantism gained a foothold, it tended to influence the social, economical, political, and the cultural life of the communities. But when we look at it carefully, in terms of Protestantism, there are five distinct tenets that we can take note of. And these are referred to as the five solas. The first one being sola scriptura, which means scripture alone, where the Bible alone is the sole authority for all matters of faith, life, and doctrine. Secondly, sola fide, which speaks about faith alone, where salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone and not through the indulgence in terms of any kind of, of sacraments. Then we have sola gratia, which means grace alone. That is, salvation is by the grace of God alone. Then we have solus Christus, which speaks to Christ alone, where salvation is found only in Jesus Christ because of his atoning sacrifice. Then, of course, the fifth tenet would be soli deo gloria, which means for the glory of God above, where salvation is accomplished by God alone and only for his glory. So Protestantism was associated, and we're looking, for example, now in the Jamaican context, with black nationalism. And it was geared primarily towards the improvement of the blacks that were ruled by a white minority. So we're talking about, um, you know, from slavery, from, from the days of slavery. So various services were offered, varying from welfare to literacy, and the major role of providing services for those who are in need. So the Protestant bedrock principle of the priesthood of all believers, not only threw down and trampled upon papal authority, but destroyed absolute monarchy, paving the way for the rise of democracy. To this day, the Pope claims supreme authority in all human affairs as the presumed inheritor of both the imperial power of the Caesars and of Christ. So one of the things that you see in terms of an early departure from the whole matter of Catholicism is the fact that they did not believe in the succession of what is called the popes, which would have begun, as some would have believed, uh, with Peter. So what we also discovered is that Protestantism was also a part of the groups, organizations, that was responsible, right, in terms of dealing with the abolition of slavery, right? And, of course, it resulted in a much more reformed aspect of our, our part of Christianity. Now, so what Protestantism does is that it denounces the evils or the ills of society. And so what we found out was that Protestant states liberated the slaves way ahead of those states that would have been dominated by Roman Catholicism. The next thing that Protestantism did is that it propelled by its notions of equality before God and direct access to God. So in other words, it saw everybody as equal. 
not in terms of this whole hierarchical thing that was, you know, the ideal of the organization that it basically succeeded. And it believed in human freedom as a part of its overall tenets of restoration. So historians suggest that Protestantism provided the root system for Western-style democracy. So it was active in terms of how it influenced the political system and indeed the governance of the day. And it also played a part in the emergence of intellectual thought thinking. One of the things that we can readily look at, for example, in Jamaica, is the kind of role that Protestants have played, especially in tertiary education, the whole matter of the, the setting up of many tertiary institutions, in particular, teachers' colleges. So what we find here is that we believed in the upliftment of individuals out of poverty. Now, with regards to the Jamaican context, what we found was that there was a melding of the Afro-Caribbean ritual with Western Christianity that produced a religious hybrid that is referred to as Revival Zion or Revival Pokemania. Now, despite the efforts of the Protestant missionaries to maintain a clear line of demarcation between Afri African religion or Afro-religion and Christianity, the practices were so ingrained that it prevented that from literally happening. So the form of Christianity that emerged was one of what we call syncretism, where there was a merger of Maya with Christianity to produce a new form of religion that was both unifying in terms of the slaves, and it had this energizing factor to it. And of course, I would dare to say that this was tantamount to the huge success of Pentecostalism within Jamaica later on. So Jamaica is today a fervently Christian society that is largely Protestant, right? Of course, you have evidences of evangelical and also the charismatic. Now, what they found out, right, was that most of the others basically appealed more to a middle class vis-a-vis -vis as against what the Pentecostals would have appealed to. However, we have noticed the changing phase of that over time. So what we have witnessed is a rapid growth of Protestantism that literally gave birth to Pentecostalism within the context of Jamaica. When I looked at the whole matter of something that happened especially in our history in the 1860-61, which was an offshoot, the great revival or the great awakening that was in the Americas from 1857 to 1858. Of course, it started out with a noonday prayer meeting and it began to spread until most churches were literally impacted and affected by this, which is called the Great Revival. Some of the things that characterized that was the pattern of earnest prayer, conviction of sins, painful penitence, outright conversions. These were a part of what happened. Now, within the context of Jamaica, what was discovered was that every church was influenced and affected by this. The entire nation was affected. So backsliders returned. Thousands were converted and baptized. Great numbers sought admission to the churches and also for membership. And of course, this included many young people, right? And in fact, one missionary recorded the fact that in the 30 years that he had been in Jamaica, he had never seen a movement quite like that. Also, that what characterized this movement was the reading of the Bible, praise, prayer, 
and of course, the preaching of the word. What was noticeable was what happened in the society as a result of this movement. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, the conviction of sin, crime was lessened, ethical standards were raised, the power of old superstitious beliefs were broken, broken marriages were healed or mended, many left their lovers and returned to their families, and thousands of cohabiting couples were united in Christian marriage. Drunkards became abstainers, blasphemers began to call upon the name of God, and there was a holy fear and reverence. Things like rum shops, gambling houses were closed, and prodigal children were reclaimed. So what seemed to have happened during that great move was that the moral landscape of the nation was dramatically transformed during the months of this revival. So the main focus was primarily on a transformed life. And of course, it had an effect in terms of some of the social systems that were in vogue. So the Pentecostal movement grew out of the need for some members of Protestant Christian churches to see holiness demonstrated. And you can't talk about Pentecostalism without talking about that fervent desire for holiness, right? And so what we found also is that there was a reverence for God, the whole idea of sanctity, sanctification. And of course, the Pentecostal fires burned rightly because they wanted to return to an apostolic holiness where there would be a strict adherence to the biblical principles. Now, many scholars also, in talking about the origins of Pentecostalism, right, have you know located and believed that it emerged somewhere in around the 19th century. And some of the things that have been highlighted in terms of the focus, in terms of some of the doctrinal tenets, had to do with things like a personal salvation, divine healing, baptism of the Holy Spirit, of course, evidence speaking in tongues, and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of these were literally stressed. And of course, the spirit baptism was seen as an integral part to both empowerment and for persons to be able to live out this Christian life. Of course, chain to Pentecostalism was the whole matter of not just the religious fervor and intensity, but the boldness that characterized the lives of the individual. And of course, this would have affected the society as a whole. Now, one of the tensions that came up as it, as it relates to Pentecostalism was between the social and the spiritual concerns. And of course, you would have people at the end of both spectrum. Those that believed that the church should not be engaged in any kind of social reform, social practice, or social behaviors, and those that felt that this should be indeed a necessary part of it. So some thought that it was not necessary to be engaged in handouts that could have been left to another you know, facet of society. And of course, some were going to meet somewhere in the middle where there should be a blending of both factors. I think one of the things that emerged also was that because they preached the imminent return of the Lord, they figured that there should be literally non-involvement in certain aspects of the society. And so the main focus would have been on the proclamation of the word and not necessarily an engagement in terms of society that would look towards social and societal reforms. So the main tenet would have been the preaching of the gospel message. And persons that got engaged or involved in any kind of social retreat or social programs would have been vilified. 
Now, the thing with Pentecostals is that they speak eloquently and passionately about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, especially in the life of the Christian church. So their spirit theology was, however, limited to the confines of the sanctuary and reflected mostly in things like, you know, the worship rituals and the preaching of the word. But it never extended outside of the building, really to take a place within the context of, of, of society. So it was more about proclamation, but it needed to engage and to include practice because there was an insistent urgency in terms of not just causing a person to live right, right, but in terms of that person's holistic development. And so it had to play a role as it relates to the poor and also the speaking out against the ills and the evils of society. So what we found also is that in many instances, there's a failing in terms of the commitment to social action in preference or in deference to just literally preaching and teaching the word of God. But it failed to address certain concerns within the context of the society, right? Looking at the whole matter of some social ills and issues and to speak out against the whole matter of injustices. So what is necessary, therefore, is that proclamation must be matched with practice in order for one's faith to literally come alive. So the church, church's voice must be supported by corresponding activity in terms of what our hands and our feet are engaged in because we now become the living embodiment of what Christ represented here on earth. So we would speak out against and aid in a bit in terms of the dismantling of any kind of oppressive systems that would be within the context of the society. And so, the church would need to forge ahead in terms of some partnership with perhaps other existing agencies to effectively now, you know, begin to bring this particular aspect of the thing about. And so I believe that the call right now is for us to begin to look at how Pentecostalism and emerging Pentecostalism, if we could call it that must now begin to affect the whole matter of societies. Because there are ministries that we currently have, right, that can be utilized in terms of influencing and affecting society, right? What we have noticed, and if I could speak to, before I go back to this, the whole matter of what I, what I believe has been the contribution of the Church of God of Prophecy to, Pentecost, to Pentecostalism in Jamaica. One of the things that we have seen is the evangelistic fervor and witness that has been demonstrated. Where the church book literally, Acts 1-8, which speaks about being an effective witness in terms of bringing Christ everywhere. And one of the things that we have seen, in fact, there was a time in Jamaica when the Church of God of Prophecy was the fastest growing Pentecostal type church. Now we are, we are second. And we would have listened to anecdotal information where those who have gone on before us would have indicated just this action to share the message of Jesus. And there was a level of boldness and fervor that characterized the open displays of just simply claiming this message. We, we have seen the church also, right, being engaged in training programs. And I remember there was a time when the entire membership would come together, right? And there was a program, Bible Training Institute and Bible Training Camp. And this would prepare the general membership for Christian witness. So there was a heavy belief in terms of training, right? Where there was not just a dependency on one's ability to speak, but one must be trained 
in order to ably represent not just Christ, but the gospel that was being promulgated. The third point I wanted to make, and when I thought about this particular one, because having spoken with a number of serious leaders, Pentecostal leaders in Jamaica, and sometimes evangelical leaders, one of the things that they have said to me, right, is that the Church of God of Prophecy has provided them with individuals that function effectively within their ministries. Because people, having left our organization, have found themselves a place within those. And so there has been the provision of leaders. It's almost like certain profession, like, for example, teachers within Jamaica. Many of them have gone abroad to service other countries and indeed nationalities. And so many churches and parachurches have benefited from the training and the discipline that have been brought to our membership. Now, sometimes many might see this in a negative light in terms of us losing people. But there is a positive benefit when you look overall that they, that they might have left the church, but they have not been lost to the kingdom. So what has happened is that they might have benefited from being trained in our institution, but then the field of endeavor might be in other organizations. And I see this as a positive, something positive that is literally happening. The fourth point I wanted to make was that many of the more established or evangelical churches would have benefited, right? Would have benefited from things like, you know, the whole matter of the deliverance ministry. Because there is that notion of that, that there were certain problems of a spiritual nature that their congregants were experiencing. Then, of course, they saw the Church of God of Prophecy and its Pentecostal movement as having the ability to deal with problems that could not have been dealt with by medical practitioners, um, you know, based on medical, you know, diagnosis and so on. And so many have benefited from that aspect of the church's ministry, where we believe in the ability of Christ to deliver. And so I see that also as a positive contribution as it relates to the Jamaican landscape. The next aspect I want to mention is the application of divine healing. This, I believe, has been a significant contribution. So sometimes what you'll find is that our fasting services might be packed up. Our Sunday night services, in some cases where, you know, we used to have them, would have been packed up. People would have sought for healing that was literally supernatural. So I see this as a positive contribution also. But we have to look at the vibrancy of the worship, right? And yes, that was a departure from certain of the liturgical order that the established churches would have. But I believe that the vibrancy of the worship was also a major positive contribution, right, to Jamaica as a whole. And of course, we have to look at the contribution in terms of the music, the arts, and of course, in terms of, you know, setting up of social programs have benefit, benefited, that people have benefited from. Even in terms of the whole matter of the provision of food, the provision of accommodation, just working and assisting um, in terms of community outreach. And, you know, the list could go on in terms of the levels of social contribution that have been made by various, various local churches within the context of their communities. And of course, you know, if you look at the educational aspect, I grew up seeing many Church of God of Prophecies that were engaged in early childhood ed education, right? And so this, I believe, was also something that was um, certainly positive. But I also want to mention the message that we preached, which was a proclamation of a message of hope message of hope amidst the uncertainties of life. That was something that was literally, you know, promulgated with holy 
fervor. And so what we begin to realize is that there has been significant, and I would say it again, significant contributions by the church as such. But I want to close off this discourse by mentioning that we have to take it a little bit further. And there needs to be the emergence of a new Pentecostalism. The Pentecostalism is going to be reflective, meditative in scope. One that is going to look at social and societal injustices. One that is going to be concerned a whole lot with what is happening on the outside of the church and not just what is happening on the inside of the church. And we're saying that this new Pentecostalism must become what is now normative or what is going to be normative. Because this is going to show and to demonstrate to the wider society, right, what is it that we are capable of doing. And so we have to move with alacrity, with hope, with compassion as we begin to engage the society at these particular levels. I should also mention that a number of those within our church organizations have had access to particular positions where their influence is being brought to bear, especially in the corridors of decision making. And so we have to give regard to the fact that we're going to have to produce or to provide a theology that is going to inform and inspire, not one that is going to lead to civity and ineffectiveness, but one that would engage the society as a whole. Yes, we believe in the empowerment of the spirit and so on, but we are saying that we, we have to reach to the point where we begin to understand the context in which we are here doing ministry. And we have to facilitate what needs to be done in order to create a greater impact than the one that we have taken. Of course, there's going to be the emergence of mergers where we begin to work with and alongside our church organization, community organizations, in order to provide not just hope to people, but to lead ultimately to the transformation of lives. And of course, that is going to reveal the redemptive ability of God. So we're looking not just as individuals, but we're looking at transforming society as a whole. And of course, we'd be guided by biblical principles. And we would definitely be following in the steps of our master. And so I want to make it quite clear that the shape of Pentecostalism is changing, where it is not just looked at as a movement that is only characterized by speaking in tongues, but as a movement that will present a vibrant witness. And I like what Acts 1 8 indicated, you shall be witnesses unto me. So as our lives are transformed, by extension, we will forward into society and begin to lead transformation in all the various things that influences society as a whole. And I'd like to pause there. Wow. I'm sure that many persons are saying, just give me a minute so that I can wrap my mind around all that has been said, because truly we have been exposed to so much information. So I know persons have questions, so go ahead and put them in the Q&A segment. And Sister Camille Jackson is coming now to lead us in the Q&A segment. Over to you, Sister Camille. Good evening, everyone. Um, Bishop Rodney, I've never been any, in any of your classes, but I'm sure I would have learned a lot of things if I was to be lucky enough to be in any of your classes. Um, I have two questions so far. Mm -hmm. And I think Dr. Campbell might have answered one, but let me just 
still feel it so that the person will feel comfortable that the question was aired out enough. Um, Auntie May said, explain how Pentecostalism came about. Okay. Well, in terms of um, Pentecostalism, this time we're looking at in and around the, the 19th century. And of course you have the whole historical thing where people were seeking after God, read about the experiences in Acts, wanted to have that kind of an experience that was demonstrated there and i'm just giving it in a in a in a nutshell right and that was literally how it came back to the fore but in terms of its origin right that would have been somewhere you know in the book of acts in terms of the the first century thereabouts but one of the things that um if you if you read the historical records they would have pushed for having the same experience that the disciples would have had in the upper room, right? That was primarily their motivation to have a similar experience. And this would have been in and around, you know, the turn of the 19th century. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I'll leave my questions for last. Um, there was another question by Marvin Logan, who was asking if there's any available statistics or information that shows whether or not Pentecostalism is spreading or decreasing among modern day church? There is information to suggest that it's actually spreading. There is information. And um, if you look at the statistics I, I started out with in terms of seeing it as 10.8%, and this came from a, a survey that was done in 2010. And what emerged, because initially, right, it would have been the other, the, the other Protestants that would have been leading. But over time, what we have found out, Pentecostals, 10.8%, Anglican, 10.6%, Lutheran, 9.7%, Baptist, 9%, and so on. So the Pentecostals have literally overtaken. And I've mentioned a number of reasons why they have done that, simply because there was a provision of certain aspects of spirituality that were not found in their own organizations. I mean, dealing with things like spirit possession, the whole matter of divine healing, you know, the fervor in terms of worship and witness, those are some of the aspects that actually cause the movement to grow rapidly. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question here coming up, and I think some of these questions are coming out of our conversation here and they're coming in more and more. All right, so this one this is similar to what I would have asked. Is there a difference between Pentecostalism and the charismatic movement? If yes, how do they differ? All right, <laughs> there, there is a difference, there's a difference. I mean, both of them believe in the whole matter of the infilling of, of the Holy Spirit, but the charismatics tend to base a lot of what they do on you know, extra biblical experiences, more so in terms of, you know, and they, they, they focus a whole lot more on just the, the operations of the gifts. And sometimes, you know, there, there, there can be some very clear-cut departures from, from biblical orthodoxy in terms of some of the things that they literally believe. For example, the Pentecostals would say, you speak in tongues as the Spirit gave, as the Spirit gives utterance. The charismatics would say you have a language and you need to use that language. So in other words, it's almost like having been baptized in the Holy Spirit, as we, as we say, you know, automatically, all of a sudden, have a language that you can utilize to will. So, you know, that, that, that's one of the subtle differences um, there. Okay. All right. Um, the same person, I think, they are asking again about statistics, if my memory is correct, the last set of statistics, which stated that COGOP Jamaica was the second largest movement mm -hmm. in Jamaica was 2010. What's the current mm -hmm. standing of our organization in subsequent surveys? I'll tell you something. Um, somebody came by my house to do a census and it is still the same. In fact, Church of God of Prophecy was right there behind the New Testament. So it is still the same. But I guess um, with the current census that is going on, 
right, a more up-to-date representation and figures will be available. Okay. All right. Um, Larone Clark is asking, if I am on point, as you, you are, Sir Rodney, modern Pentecostalism is transformed in having outreach, social club, and institutions where the gospel is to be taken. It's joining the sect, selected group, with the gospel through boldness of the spirit. So I'm guessing that this is a comment more than a question. Mm -hmm. and but but we have to take it beyond that. This is one of the things I, I would see in terms of an emerging new Pentecostalism, where we begin to engage, right, with... Um, with the legislature, the judicial, we, we begin to engage on that level because what we're looking at is being able to look at what are the major influences in society and not necessarily to go there to preach, but to be a part of the decision-making process that can result in the kind of changes that would be deemed necessary for the improvement and the betterment of the life of the constituents of Jamaica. So therefore, one of the things I think is incumbent and important is that a number of our young professionals have to begin to recognize what is their particular role. I, I like to put it this way, that you're a Christian first, and then secondly, secondarily, you have your profession, but your faith must inform your profession. So you're not a Christian that is an accountant, but you're a Christian accountant. And I dare say that there is a place in this new emerging Pentecostalism for individuals to become a part of the political order. You, it's difficult to change something from the outside. It's easier to change it from the inside. And that's one of the reasons why I also indicated that we have to get involved in meditation, reflective thinking, begin to start to think outside of just what we do within the context of the four walls of the church and begin to engage in society, begin to understand exactly what is going on out there and how it is that we can ably represent Christ simply by being a part of the decision-making process. Um, and if I, if I may, sir, I dare say that this is one of the things that Minister Nikisha speaks about all the time, that we take our Christianity in every sphere of our workplace. You know, um, and you're right, we take we are a Christian first and then we are the accountant second. So we take it into how we use our integrity and persons are looking on to see how it is that we would deal with certain situations since we say we're a Christian. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, next question. The COGOP has been around for long enough to have a voice that impacts spaces outside of the walls of the church. Mm -hmm. We are powerful people. We need to transform the political, educational, financial, social, emotional, even sexual outlook of the world around us. I believe we can do this. We are a youthful church. We have the talents, gifts, abilities, qualifications, and more to do this. Yes. May we begin to allow our voices to be heard loudly in this country. Jamaica needs this. So I think that's another comment. Yeah, but I think like engagements like this, right um will we'll fuel those kinds of considerations and um activities and i would dare say that perhaps we need to look at maybe another forum where you know we bring together groups that would be able to look critically at certain things and sum up with how it is that we're, but remember remember this we are not working in isolation there are already groups that are far ahead in terms of the engagement process that we could learn from. And I believe that if we collectively begin to pool our efforts together, we'd be able to achieve much. Let, let me say this quickly, right? That we need to recognize that the main distinction in society is not between the sacred and the secular. And I think this is one of the, 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 the mistakes that we have made, that if it's not in the Bible, then it can't be truth, it can't be of God. But let me be bold enough to make a statement that all truth is God's truth, whether it's in the Bible or not. And so what really needs to happen here, right, is that the distinction should be between what is sacred and what is profane. That's where the real distinction is, between sacred and profane, between what is sacred and what's an abomination. 
and not between sacred and secular. Because we need the secular or you wouldn't have a society. Okay. All right. Um, someone else is asking. Yes, it's a question. Is Pentecostalism also growing because some evangelists? Let me let me read that again. Is Pentecostalism growing because some evangelists are also experiencing the power and move of the Holy Spirit? I know of Catholics and Baptist members who speak in tongues and believe in mm -hmm. the power of the Holy Spirit. What category would they be in? Well, they normally call him charismatic for some reason or the other rather than Pentecostal uh, because of the, you know, the kind of operations and, and movements, right? But, but, but I, I, wa I want to say this, right, that God is capable of influencing and affecting his people anywhere they are located. He's capable of doing that. And as I mentioned, you know, the great revival in Jamaica, 1866 to 1. And when you read reports like from Reverend Philippa of Philippa Baptist fame, and you read the reports coming from out of the Moravia, what was what characterized, right? All the churches in Jamaica, and notice I said all the churches in Jamaica, including the strong Caribbean people, right? Was with, with, with all the things that were symptomatic of Pentecostalism was happening all across Jamaica in every single church. In fact, the Baptist church indicated that their membership increased by 6,000 in a few months because of this Pentecostal, this Pentecostal beard. Now, one of the things that I said in the presentation that a lot of people might not like is that Pentecostalism almost emerged out of this revival thing. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of people find themselves very tied. And, um, you know, sometimes there's a struggle in terms of belief system, right? Because it's evidently there, as I mentioned, that the whole thing of revivalism came about out of a merger between nihilism and Christianity. And then when the Great Awakening came now, then, of course, all the movements were literally influenced and effect, affected by the whole thing. But we see the revival, but this is for another presentation. But revivalism, revivalists now are now coming up with an emerging theology to show the closeness rather than, you know, how different they are. From, in fact, they claim to be a Christian religion. And so what we find is that coming up in their organization are individuals that are willing to tackle. One of them asks the question, why am I not being invited in your churches to preach? Why? why? But let me just say something here, Camille. As I reflected today, one of the thoughts that came to my mind, and I want to throw this out as a challenge, right? We need to get a bunch of professionals to start writing the history of the church with some level of scholarship, right? That would take into the consideration where, what our journey has been. Look at the pros and the cons, a very objective analysis of, of the journey that we have taken for this 100 years. And what, 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 should be the, what should the next 100 years look like? What are the things that we need to tackle? What are the things that we need to contend and we need to deal with? Because we can't just be a tongue talking people. We can't just be that. And in fact, if I really analyze Acts chapter 2, the Bible clearly indicates that the tongues that were spoken at Pentecost was primarily for the purpose of witness. Right? They all heard, every man heard them speak in his own language concerning the wonderful works of God. So the tongues at Pentecost was primarily in fulfillment of Acts 1, 8, where there was witness. But let's leave that for another discussion. But I just wanted to whet your appetite. All right, before I, before I read the other question, I have a question. Um, I have noticed, I teach a particular class where I have to look at culture. And when mm -hmm. my students give me information about religion in other countries, I hardly see Pentecostalism as one of the religions that is practiced in that particular country. Is it that it is based on some ethical underpinning? So is it more on the side of persons who are of all complexion as opposed to persons? No. It has nothing to do with ethnicity. Okay. What you'll find is that, so this side of the hemisphere, 
the, 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 the primary movement that came here would have been Catholicism. So especially if you look at South America and so and a lot of these countries, that is that was what predominates. Pentecostalism is relatively a new phenomenon that has been moving into these various enclaves and, and, and making representations as such. So in some cases, it might not be the dominant form of religious expression or experience, but it is gaining ascendancy in a number of instances and um and cases. Yes. Right, thanks. I have more information to give my students. Um, Doreen Allen. Is but, but sorry, let, let me just say this quickly before you move on. What what you have to recognize whenever Christianity confronts culture, there is going to be a crisis of thought. When Christianity confronts culture. One of the problems we sometimes have is that the brand of Christians that we practice, it has too much, too much cultural trappings. So it's not just presenting objectively the gospel. No, we, we, it's almost like what I would call um, cultural imperialism that accompanies the proclamation because we're carrying certain societal preferences with us. And what people might sometimes be resisting is not necessarily Jesus, but a cultural imposition that they feel and experience where we come across as our culture being superior to other cultures, right? And so we, we have to be uniquely aware of, of that. And, and I think that sometimes those who would do missions culturally or even across you know, certain divides must be sensitive to the culture of the day. I'll give you a, a thing where um, this missionary group went to this uh, country to minister and the kids saw a Buddha statue, sat on it with their feet dangling in the face of Buddha. No, the foot in Buddhism, right, is one of the most unholy part of the human anatomy. So of course that blocked any form of effective witness. And I think that sometimes we're afraid of engagement because we see engagement as conflict and confrontational. And sometimes we have to learn to listen before we speak, rather than just trying to push things down people's throats. You look at what Paul did in Acts chapter 16 when he was in Athens and he came into that Greek uh, uh, Areopagus, the amphitheater. Notice the Bible says, when he saw the city was wholly given over to idolatry, he was stirred. I think it would be reflective Right, and indeed, um, you know, really good for us to look at Paul's approach. And even though the philosophers didn't get saved, yet the witness was done. And it shows us how to have cultural sensitivity. And not because we have the truth, it means that we can trample on people's culture. All right, just a little nugget there. All right, that is really for another conversation because that is putting over into. What is it called now? Pluralism. Um, and <laughs> let's not go into that arena at all. All right. So my next question is, can you explain again? All right. Let me read it as it is here. Bishop, can you please explain again the Pentecostal speaking in tongues versus the charismatic asking to use their language? Okay. I thought that was really clear. <laughs> One will say, Spirit gives you utterance. The other will say, you have the language, just use it. All right. All right. So, um, this is a suggestion. Let me see if there's a question here before. All right. So, the suggestion here is media releases from the head office on topical issues as they arise. We cannot be silent on matters that affect the citizens of the country we serve in as spiritual leaders. The media team would therefore function outside of videography, graphic design, etc. Um, these are suggestions that are being made here. An active social media presence, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, monthly newsletters that are circulated beyond the membership of this church, a quarterly or annual magazine, scholarship, and award. So I I think that one is speaking about how it is that we could integrate ourselves within the, the social sphere of the country and not just have it within the religious sphere of what it is that we do as Pentecostal people mm -hmm. in the country. 
All right, so Samuel Mitchell is asking, what is your thoughts that Pentecostal shines out of crisis or issues happening within the society? I don't know, let me- I'm not sure I understand what is being asked. What, I guess, what are your thoughts that Pentecostal shines out of, of crisis or issues happening within the society? Um, I don't know if you could- Try and rewrite that question, Samuel. Um, if it means that if there is a crisis, then it tends to foster greater, greater unity among the Pentecostals, a greater fervency in terms of prayer, and a certain boldness to, to treat with what's going on. I'm, I'm not sure what's been asked, but those are some of the things that would, would, would come to mind. That sometimes adversity would give rise to a greater expression of Pentecostalism. Okay. All right. I hope that he can clarify it before we end. Oh, um, hello? Yes. Are you hearing okay. me? Samuel. Yes, good night. Mm. Yes. yes. So I was asking though, um, yeah, because Pentecostal, yeah, I was asking though, out of like Pentecostal, out of the crisis and uh, you know, challenges and obstacles and uh, where the in society where you have a lot of obstacles and things rising out, um, a lot lawlessness, and so that Pentecostal when where Pentecostal start rising, when in society have a lot of on lawlessness happening, and uh, you know ungodliness, and so is it that the Pentecostal where persons would just seek to want to um to want to grow closer. To God and for him to, to do something, you know, supernatural. And it will you say that or that Pentecostal um was, was something that was called for that you know person was wanted to have that experience. So to God able to make a difference and change a turn in, in what was happening at the time or in events happening in this time or in at that time. I think one of the things that I mentioned in the presentation was that the message of Pentecostalism is always a message of hope, right? A message of transformation, a, a message that would indicate that change is not only possible, but change is inevitable. And so what I see, yes, you can find that some of these um, adverse situations can act as a catalyst, but in terms of its expression, it's more so the, 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 yield, the yielding and the surrender of individuals to the Holy Spirit that is going to facilitate, right, you know, that form of expression in terms of its growth, its visibility, and its functionality. Okay, um, Samuel, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, yes, that answers my question. All right. Yeah. All right, um, Novlet Clark is asking if Pentecostalism emerged from revivalism, why then the Christian church is sometimes against the revivalist type of worship or their beliefs? What I was alluding to is not that it emerged in terms of that it informed it, but I'm saying that the fervency that was demonstrated by these Africans would have facilitated the Pentecostal expression among the Blacks, because that's literally where it started, would have facilitated that because they were used to being very expressive in their form and in their way of worship. So when Pentecostalism came, right, people would have already been familiar with this kind of a vibrant um, type of worship form. And so it would have facilitated it because it would not have been strange in terms of the expressions. The theology of both is fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that helps. Yes, I hope <laughs> help to Navlet, um, because I was a little bit, but myelism is what you alluded to and not revivalism as much. So I hope she understood that question clearly. All right, are there any other evidence? Andrew is asking, are there any other evidence of, of having the baptism of the Holy Spirit other than speaking in tongues? Right. This will take a whole program by itself <laughs> because 
sometimes we use terms loosely in terms of things like what is baptism in the Holy Spirit, what is being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I, I wouldn't want to open that discussion, but I would just say one thing here. In terms of what happens when people are filled with the Spirit, based on what Acts said, we hear tongues, we hear boldness, we hear preaching of the word. So there is there are a myriad of expressions because the purpose of the infilling is to provide what is needed so that there can be an expression in however or whichever way. Sometimes it can be an abundance of wisdom. Sometimes it can be a word of knowledge that comes to facilitate what the spirit needs to get done. Right? That's as far as I can go with that. Because the other discussions, we'd have to track the various usages of the term and to come to an understanding as to exactly what was going on there. And the Bible does say that by one spirit, we are baptized into the body. So it is the act of the Holy Spirit to place us in the body of Christ, and that's called a baptism. Okay, right. So that question goes segued into this other question. Um, I think, Dr. Campbell, are you going to be answering this question, Dr. Campbell? I see that your mic is up. All right, I'll read it in the meantime. We are a body. This is Lenford Lalo, who is asking, we are a body who embrace speaking in tongues as the spirit give utterance. But I have never seen someone with the gift of interpretation of tongues in our organization or other what's what's your advice on the matter i would simply say the spirit determines what he wants to do and we become submitted and subject to that if he does not see the necessity of the operation of a particular gift then we bow to his sovereignty we it's not what we want to say or what we like it's the spirit that determine the form of manifestation based on his administration of the gifts that becomes important and I suppose this is why persons looking on, not understanding the things of the spirit, will be mm -hmm. saying, you know, what are these people doing? You know, because if it is that we could really interpret what one other person says, how is it that this part of the manifestation is not operating as much? You know, so yeah, can I just be an advocate just a little <laughs> bit? Sometimes we can hear tongues. But it's not necessarily a Holy Spirit intervention. Let's face the facts. That's true. Right? Sometimes it's just tongues, but no substance. Sorry. But, <laughs> but I, I, I believe that the Holy Spirit will provide what is deemed necessary the particular time. He determines the expression. Okay. Um, Dr. Any other question? And I'll read the comment that this anonymous attendee um, is also giving us more suggestion. Um, um, okay, so they're saying, and a church website is absolutely absolutely necessary. We have so much to share with the world with, with, with this world, sorry. This session, for example, imagine a recording. Okay, so I, suggest, I think they're suggesting that we should have recorded it and we should have it sent out. But I think um, it's on YouTube, so you can always, once you subscribe to the Church of God of Prophecy Jamaica, you'll be able to find this conversation or this, this, this forum again. Um, for you to rewatch. So if it, if it is that you're asking if a recording could be sent to you, then it is on YouTube for you to view again, if you so desire. All right, this is anonymous attendee asking. Um, okay, so this is a YouTube question. What are the char characteristics of Pentecostals? What make them stand out? It's a very good question. But i will just be repeating myself. I've said that several times over. So I would advise the person just go back and Re-listen to the thing. Okay. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. I have no more questions so far. Okay. I have experienced. Okay. This person is saying that they have experienced 
the gift of interpretation in the church of God of property. All right. And just as Bishop said, it is not our decision to decide what it is that we're going to be led into, do, to, into doing. It is the Holy Spirit that is going to give you the utterances to interpret or to speak. All right. How does this redemptive analogy work in the Jamaican context? Hmm, Howard Face is asking that question. How does redemptive analogy work in the Jamaican context? All right. For example, you hear, you hear a thing like Jesus Christ is Lord. That's scripture. If you look at the Jamaican context, what would be a similar, how could we represent the word Lord in a Jamaican context? Right? What one word in Jamaica would clearly define what Lord is? Hmm. Hmm. This one word, you know, just three letters. <laughs> God. <laughs> done. God. Yes. Thank you, Ro. Yeah, that, that's clearly it. So, so what we're saying is that you can find something within the culture that you can use because in every culture, God always places, yeah, bossy, all those expressions. I mean, and you'll find that some people might find it a little bit, they might be a little bit uneasy with some of the, the language, right? But nevertheless, it works because people understand what you're saying because they are, they're, they're coming from a particular cultural context where, if, because when you say Jesus is Lord, you know, most time we tend to romanticize with the term Lord because there's not full understanding of what it really means. If you ask the average Christian, you know, they don't know what Jesus is Lord actually means because that's a medieval term coming from the Middle Ages where you had lords and overlords and serfs under the feudalism system. So they might not, not even understand that or embrace that. So if you can find something within the society and use it as a frame of reference to say this is because, listen, me, when you say Jesus is Lord, it means that you are giving up all your rights to follow the instruction of that one individual. And that's what a don does. You have to literally be subservient, right? That, that kind of a thing. So there are things that you can utilize. Um, I remember there's this group, I think say Eskimos. Yeah. Eskimos, and this man went there to minister to them. And he was talking about the Lamb of God, and they could not understand what on earth he's talking about. Because then they'd never seen a lamb. Lambs can't survive where they live. And so when they say Jesus is the Lamb of God, it made no sense to them. So you have to find now and a phrase that would be equivalent, a functional equivalent phrase. And so what they refer to Jesus as was the seal of God, S-E-A-L. because And they understood that they needed a seal to survive. The seal provided everything they needed to survive. So when he said Jesus is the seal of God, they understood clearly that seal has to die in order that you might live. All right? Well, that, that's missions. I think <laughs> persons are um, agreeing with you to say that when you're asking about this three-letter word, someone said done. And someone said, instead of saying Jesus is Lord, Jesus is the boss. So Yeah, you can say bossy, yeah. Bossy, I suppose. This bossy, is... yeah. Bossy. When, when a man says bossy, it's a, it's, a, it's a serious term of respect. Yes, yes. True. That is true. And I've heard, um, I've heard persons speak about how we pray. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's almost like we can't pray in patwa because... Mm -hmm. Somehow we think that the Lord will not understand us. You know, he, he made languages, so he can understand if we speak in our dialect or if we speak in English. That, that is religious conditioning. That is, that is also true. <laughs> yeah. That's, um, and that's why we have the Patwa Bible now. I can't wait to use it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, question here. Should we be, let me see, should we still be celebrating Pentecost after Easter? Just like when the disciples were waiting on the mighty move, um, the promised Holy, Holy Ghost, meaning a specific day. Right. Um, it's important in terms of a reflection, as you know, we're guided by the event that happened in history. My problem is trying to duplicate it. Where you need earth, wind, and fire. Sorry, you know, fire, wind. <laughs> <laughs> no, like a, that is my problem. We have to have an understanding that, that, that since the Spirit came, 
in obedience to what Jesus said that he was going to come. We now have the spirit at the point of conversion. Because Jesus cannot be in us and the spirit not be in us. That's virtually impossible. Because the Holy Spirit is referred to as the spirit of Christ. So what I think needs to be fleshed out is an understanding of what obtains this side of Pentecost. All right. All right. Um, let me see now. Okay, there's another question here. What would you suggest to be done to treat with the generational gap that currently exists in our congregation against the context of impactful Pentecostal living? Wow. Um, let me read that again. What would you suggest be done to treat with the generational gap that currently exists in our congregations against the context of impactful Pentecostalism. I'm not sure I understand the question. Because I think sometimes the gap is a perception and not necessarily reality. I've had a chance to speak with some of the elders and I find them to be more informed than we think. They might not be able to articulate at the level that we do. But then I recognize something. They believed in witness. I find it difficult for this 21st century set of believers to actually get involved in what is really called witness, which means knowing Christ personally and being willing to share of your experiences with him to others. So I, I don't know about the gap. Maybe the gap is that we need to go closer back to where they were. Right? For example, we, we come to a fast and a prayer, right? to do some tongue talking and to see miracles. They came to a fast to experience God, to be close to him. And I think I like what they did more than what we're doing right now. And so fasting services have turned into deliverance services. And now we used to come there and, and cast out demons. The purpose of it, look at Isaiah 58. There's nothing about demons in that. It has to do with realigning your life with God. And I think that sometimes we are the ones who have strayed from what really should be. Okay. Um, I think this is going to be my last question here from the question and answer section. Um, Jenny Ann Thompson, please forgive me if I pronounced your first name incorrectly. Jenny Ann, what challenges and opportunities does Pentecostalism face in Jamaica today and how is the movement adapting to changing social and cultural trends? All right. One of the challenges would be irrelevance, especially if it is seen just as a bunch of chattering people um, with inintelligible expressions. That doesn't have any relevance. In fact, Paul spoke to something like that where he said, listen, it's better if somebody comes in, they hear an inspired, audible utterance in a language they can understand than just hear whole plethora of tongues which has no meaning to them. So I think sometimes the question of relevance, what is the relevance of this? And I think that the main problem would be that sometimes we have relegated Pentecostalism just to articulate it in tongues, not understanding the, the force of witness that is carried with it, right? The whole matter of dealing with things within a societal and social context, which was all of what I was saying previously. So I, I, I think that if, if we are not properly informed about what this really should be doing, then of course there are going to be multiple challenges. But there could also be another set where people have lost the fervency and the vibrancy of the movement. And you know, they, they basically um what's the word here? No, just acquiesce into some kind of passivity and silence and that level of mediocrity and so on. Because one of the things that always characterize Pentecostal movements is just this fervency, this zeal, this fire, this enthusiasm, this thrust to do God's will. And so sometimes the challenge is, challenge could be that we slow down on one and become deficient in the other. So it's the, it's the whole matter of striking the appropriate balance. There's a second part to that question. If you could read that for me, please. Um... And how is the movement adapting to changing social and cultural trends? 
So the opportunities, those Pentecostal faith in Jamaica today, and how is the movement adapting to changing social and cultural trends? All right. Um, I think what needs to be done is an examination of the trends and to see how best we can position ourselves to deal with this new reality. Because some of the trends and challenges that we have to contend and to deal with, Pentecostals in the bygone era never had those challenges to deal with. Let's say in order to cement our position and our place in society, we are going to have to engage, but we're going to have to engage from an informed position. So we're going to need to bring scholarship to the forefront. There's nothing wrong in study, right? And to really find out, did we get it right in terms of our understanding of scriptures? And if not, what are the things that we need to correct? And how is it? And I think rather than using the word adapt, I, I want more want to look at the whole contextualization. How can I make this relevant? Because sometimes we look at adapting to something. Um, you might bother on to compromise because you're going to entertain some ideals and some things that might not be reflective of what your true position is. In fact, we really should be the influencers that should be leading the charge to change. We must change the society, change what we're seeing, rather than simply just be just in with. And, I, and that's the reason why I keep saying that we really need to come together, sit together, talk together, study together, and look at what is going to be our approach. Notice something about the early um, apostle stroke disciples. They spent an inordinate amount of time in prayer and in study of the word of God. And that now became the precursors for God revealing to them and downloading certain strategies so that it would be acting from an informed position. We want revelation, but we don't want intimacy. Let me say it again. We want revelation, but we don't want intimacy. We want miracles, but we don't want God. And that is how I chide this generation. We're, we're all for, and I talk to my young people, oh, hold on, I said, listen, man, listen, listen. God made a promise. He will confirm the word with signs following. So if I spend time Delivering the message that God gives, I don't have to worry about signs. So I'm not preaching for signs. I'm preaching to glorify God. And when he is glorified, the signs will follow. So it's just a matter of how we articulate our position and get our belief system back into right alignment. I like that last sentence. But there's something that you spoke about. If you could just remind me of it while... I hand back over to Minister Anderson. Um, the new Pentecostalism movement is more meditative. You had some other. Yeah, there, there's a number of factors that I, I looked at in terms of um, what, what, what the new emerging Pentecostalism is going to look like. Um, meditative is going to be, you're going to be concerned in terms of social justice. Right? Um, and, 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 all, and all of those things, how to deal with certain things within the context of, of society, looking at so because listen, to me, I'm not gonna put them on this platform, but there are some serious issues that we have not been taken into consideration, sure. and we don't have no answers for because we have not spent time reflecting in terms of, of the word of God, you know, restorative justice is the whole those nine yards, right? Mm -hmm. Look at what's happening in society and how it is that we have to approach this. And anybody will tell you that scholarship not important, miss it. Right. Because we have to begin to engage seriously in scriptures. Look at the blueprint. Look at what is being reflected out there. And come up with a Holy Spirit inspired. So we're not speaking in tongues. We'll be coming up with ideas and strategies. All right. Well said, sir. Um, I'm sure there are many other questions, but we have to up um and we'll invite you to speak about some other things that came out in this forum um i don't know if you want to wait until all the way of next year's education week but we'll see what happens um thank you very much for answering all those questions you have made a lot of things much more clearer to me um you are in the church of prophecy some persons will not believe that, but I knew what in the church of prophecy and all of them practices. I will now hand back over to Minister Anderson. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Sister Camille, for leading us in the question and answer segment. I want to personally say thank you, Bishop Rodney, very much for taking the time out to enlighten us. We are enlightened and we are encouraged to be a part of the new Pentecostalism. I know Bishop said so many things, but just to quickly remind us in terms of our contribution, we are wrapping up, but in terms of our contribution, we have made significant contribution in terms of evangelism, in terms of the whole aspect of deliverance, in terms of divine healing, the vibrancy of our worship, in terms of music arts and social programs, in terms of education, as well as our messages. So we have made significant contribution to Pentecostalism in Jamaica. And Bishop also challenged us to take it further. So I also want to echo that challenge tonight and encourage us to step into the seat of decision making so that our practices can also match our proclamation. In closing, we have heard about our history. We have been reminded tonight about our history. But what I want each of us to be mindful of is the fact that we are a part of our history. We are each contributing to Pentecostalism in Jamaica and the world at large. I challenge you to play your part well. All right, so coming to us tonight, so do the vote of thanks is Le Minister Giorgio War Richards, Dean of Academics. I thank you so much, moderator. Minister Sharika Anderson. Good evening, distinguished guests, brothers and sisters. What an awesome presentation on this, the 100th anniversary of our existence in this Jamaica land we love. Rumi said, wear gratitude like a cloak and it will feed every corner of your life. As was said, I'm Georgia War Richards, Academic Dean of NCBIC and member of the Christian Education Development Committee. I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this historic occasion in the existence of the Church of God of Prophecy here in Jamaica. I firstly want to give God glory for making this activity a resounding success. It has been such an honor to be a part of this wonderful event. And so on behalf of NCBIC, I extend heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed knowledgeable guest lecturer, Bishop Valentine Rodney for his enlightening and empowering presentation. Bishop Rodney, much of your presentation has resonated with us. You indeed have called us to action as our rich Pentecostal heritage has equipped us for such. Bishop Rodney, you reminded us that as a Pentecostal movement, we have been providing our country and communities with help and support in areas that were only made possible as a result of our involvement in the Pentecostal movement, in areas such as deliverance and healing. You reminded us that the shape of Pentecostalism in Jamaica is changing, and there is a place in this society for Pentecostals like the Church of God of Prophecy. Our moderator, Minister Sharika Anderson, you navigated this virtual space with such skill and ease that as participants, we could not help but relax. Pastor Hewitt, you invoked the presence of the Lord, and we have no doubt that this has set the stage for the success that has been experienced tonight. Our Minister of Music, we thank you for ministering in song. Dr. Campbell, President of NCBIC, we want to thank you for putting us at ease through your very genuine welcome. 
Minister Jennifer Richards. You got us acquainted with the presenter we were already acquainted with, and that set the stage for excellent learning to have taken place. Brother Dave Thomas, our techie brother, our brother who is always providing technical support, a task which he applies much commitment and selflessness to. Brother Dave, we recognize tonight that it is because of your hard work. It is because of your skill and your commitment to technology and the activities of the Church of God of Prophecy. Why all this has been managed so smoothly and we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Now to the WOW team. Kudos to the WOW team the members of CEDU, the Christian Education Development Unit. Indeed, you have personified the motto, I am among you as one who serves. To all the participants, you stayed with us through this presentation. And indeed your interest and your hunger for the word of God will certainly keep the engine of the NCBIC running. You indeed provided the reason to go on. All in all, brothers and sisters, this has been historic. This is epic. And the Church of God of Prophecy in Jamaica gives God thanks for his greatness and his faithfulness towards us. God be with you. Thank you so much again, everyone, for joining. God bless you. Have a wonderful night. Surrender my life to have